Good morning. Our reading this morning comes from two, two books in the Bible, Matthew and Luke. The first, of course, being Matthew chapter 25, verses 35 to 40. For I was hungry, and you gave me food. I was thirsty, and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger, and you welcomed me. I was naked, and you gave me clothing. I was sick, and you took care of me. I was in prison, and you visited me. Then the righteous will answer him, Lord, when was it that we sent you, uh, saw you hungry, and gave you food, or thirsty, and gave you something to drink? And when was it that we saw you a stranger and welcomed you, or naked and gave you clothing? And when was it that we saw you sick or in prison and visited you? And the king will answer them, truly I tell you, just as you did it to one of the least of these who are members of my family, you did it to me. The second reading comes from the book of Luke, chapter 10, verses 25 to 29. Just then a lawyer stood up to test Jesus. A teacher, he said, what must I do to inherit eternal life? We said to him, what is written in the law? What do you read there? And he answered, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength and with all your mind and your neighbor as yourself. And he said to him, well, you have given the right answer. Do this, and you will live. But wanting to justify himself, he said to Jesus, Well, who's the neighbor? The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Good morning, church. I thought since this was our first time together with me in this capacity, I'd tell you, a little bit about myself and share why those particular scriptures hold meaning to me and how I came to be here on this path to a deacon. I grew up in a military family in Fayetteville, North Carolina. It's a small city, about 65,000, plus now 120,000 military soldiers and airmen at Fort Bragg and Pope Air Force Base. I didn't know it then, but something happened that would put me on the path to becoming a deacon. It would ultimately bring me to the church, to Michigan, and to school here. I was an army brat. As a matter of fact, my father served for 38 years in the U.S. Army. Well, what happened was my father got sent to a training program in Indiana, and he left my mother with a huge, and when I say huge, I can't say it big enough, Chrysler Imperial. My mom had issues with her sight, and the size of that monster car frightened her so much that the first opportunity she got, she went and bought a smaller car to drive us around. The problem rose when there was no place to park it. The little driveway was only big enough for the one vehicle, and that was reserved for my dad's Chrysler. The city argued that the stormwater sister couldn't handle the runoff from another driveway or parking space, so one day my mom got a ticket for parking the car in the street. Well, that's what started me on this path. It was, it was summer, I was 15, so I did a little research and decided I could build her a parking space that didn't shed water, one that would allow the rain to filter through it naturally and ultimately, I made a career out of what has now become known as sustainable, sustainable design. I end up coming to Michigan, going to school at the University of Detroit Mercy School of Architecture. And as I grew in my faith, I began to ask questions such as, why are we toxifying our skies, our streams, our lakes, our oceans? The scripture tells us that our role is to be responsible for God's beautiful and abundant creation, to be stewards of that creation, not to degrade it, the problem, and I saw an apparent conflict, 
what I saw and heard and what I saw practiced so often. So it took a lot of prayer and discernment, and I decided to per pursue a mission in ministry, in caring for creation, and it is this that has me in seminary today as I study and look for ways to improve the health of our churches, our members, and creation. And that brings us to today's word. It's always dangerous to take a verse from the Bible and try and weave a short sermon around it. In our reading today, it's significant to note that Jesus has now come triumphant into Jerusalem. He has emptied out the temple of the money changers and merchants and has been telling several parables designed to describe the kingdom of heaven and what must be done to find a reward there. He just got through chastising those that set themselves above the average Israelite, the men on the street, if you will, the average Joe. And he's now telling these gathered Pharisees and scribes that <clears throat> they are likely not going to be among those that get to see heaven. As we are listening, Jesus describes the simple things that are needed to be done. Many are turned away. Some are sad because they can't purchase a ticket into paradise or have too much other baggage that they just can't seem to find a way to leave behind. And some are, frankly, angry with Jesus. Let's listen again to these words from Matthew that Jesus is telling to these scribes and Pharisees. When was it that we saw you as a stranger or naked or hungry or sick or in prison? Jesus simply answers, just as you treat any of the least of my brothers and sisters, that is how you treat me. I want to show you a friend from southwest Detroit. Teresa Landrum lives in what has been called the most polluted zip code in Michigan, 48217. The toxins from a power plant, the coal dust from this plant, and the fumes from an oil refinery are just upwind from her house, a house of many generations. As a matter of fact, the school in her neighborhood has the only air quality monitoring alarm system in the country. Her house, which one of these companies offered to purchase, gave them a fair market price of $30,000 by the company. Now, right across the boulevard from where the neighborhood is predominantly white, the same company offered these evokes almost 70,000 for their homes. These are homes similar in construction, in age, and in size from those across the boulevard where Teresa lives. The folks in poorer neighborhoods, often people of color and indigenous peoples, are left behind, breathing in the stench of the industrial complex, including this power plant and the refineries there. This has been this family's home for three generations, and all three generations, all three generations, have had at least one member of that generation die from cancer. In 2007, Teresa was diagnosed with cancer. Both of her parents died from cancer, as did it at least eight people on her block. Teresa tells me sometimes they had three funerals a week over the years. Dr. Do Dr. Robert Heinrich, a Swedish physician, wrote in the 1960s that he was seeing way, way too many people in his practice start to show up with cancer. So he did some research, and he came to see that we were doing this to ourselves in a lot of the cases that he was seeing. He then started a project now called The Natural Step that is designed to do what people in manufacturing now call closing the loop. In the natural world, in natural ecosystems, waste equals food. Take, for example, a Michigan cherry tree. Every year it produces thousands of flowers and the leaves and the flowers, if pollinated, produce the fruit that we enjoy and eat. But the petals and the leaves then fall to the ground to provide nourishment for the tree, natural compost, giving back something of itself to the tree that produced the flower and the fruit. This is my friend Jimmy, who is a Native American, a member of Anishinaabe, a band of the Ojibwe. He also grew up in southwest Detroit, in the same zip code, and I met him at a United Methodist Church conference in Minnesota. I smoked a ceremonial pipe with him, and he shared with me why he left Detroit. In our spiritual lives, he says, we believe that the Creator spoke directly to us through the natural world. When Detroit was founded in 1701, and later when Detroit became part of Michigan, and Michigan then became a territory, all around are the Indian people. They are everywhere. They are omnipresent, and they are the majority. What we lived off of here were the fish and the wild game and the berries, wild rice 
grew on the water, and we lived in community and in harmony with our mother, the earth. I saw too many of my people dying from cancer, from disease, from the ravages of alcoholism, and so I worked my way out west. I now live in Oregon. If I were to ask Jimmy today what he would have me do, his answer would be simply to respect God's creation and to live again in harmony with her and to stop treating the rivers and lakes as sewers and to respect one another and to stop hurting one another and to respect his mother, the earth. So what has got this to do with me, we ask? I'm not dumping toxic sludge in anyone's backyard or churning out coal pollution or coal dust at any power plants. No, I'm just taking it easy living in paradise up here in suburbia. I ain't hurt nobody. Well, Jesus says that every one of these people down in southwest Detroit is one of his own, and it is our responsibility, our responsibility to care for them. My neighbor is anyone that I have the opportunity to be of service. What impacts one of these impacts all of us, if not directly, then certainly indirectly with cleanup costs and the ever-present burdens on our health care system, one so taxed right now with the current pandemic, we don't need to be adding to it. So I ask again, why does this matter to me? I mean, really, Bob, I'm not causing any one of these issues. I'm just going about my business trying to survive. Well, let's think about this for a minute. Our friend, the lawyer in Luke's gospel, starts out seemingly innocently enough asking what he has to do to inherit eternal life. Well, I think he wants a one and done answer to his question. Perhaps something like dropping off his old robes to goodwill or maybe mowing his elderly neighbor's front lawn in the heat to put it in a more contemporary vein. The implication of do is that this could easily be something he could check off the to-do list. You know, if he's good at it, really efficient, he can be done before lunch and secure his way into heaven. And I just love how our Lord turns the question back on the challenge. Well, what do you say, it says? Tell me what is written in the law. Well, we all know the answer. Love God and love your neighbor as yourself. Jesus actually gives him his short answer. He says, go and do this and you will live. So he's got what he asked for, but trying to trip Jesus up, and this is where our legal beagle gets himself into trouble. He says, well, just who is my neighbor, really? Well, I think that my neighbor is anyone who shows me an opportunity to serve. Let's unpack this a little bit here. To answer the lawyer's challenge, Jesus tells the parable of the Good Samaritan. At the time of Jesus, there were over 600 laws written around the laws of Moses and the letter of the, and the spirit of the law says to love. To love is a verb and means to do some action, to act out or to act upon. I thought for a long time growing up that love was just a noun. It was something that I could possess, I could own, I could even give it away. Well, to love is to do something for another creature, to care for another person or entity. To love God implies that I will do something for God. Let me say that again. To love God implies that I will do something for God. Well, what must I do? Well, Jesus has just told us in Matthew that we need to treat everyone with love and kindness. But is he implying only folks that are like me or like you? In Luke's gospel, we see it a little different, a little deeper. In answering the question, who is my neighbor with the story of the Samaritan, Jesus gives us not just a theology lesson, but a bit of a history lesson. You see, for several centuries, the Samaritans have been outcasts in the Jewish story. Originally, scholars credited them with the first pass at writing the laws of Moses, the Mosaic Law. They were the keepers of the Jewish face in the earliest times. But through the unfolding of history in Samaria, and remember, Jesus would be knowledgeable of this history. He was a rabbi. He was a teacher, after all. Well, between the Assyrians settling into the lost northern kingdoms through mixed marriages, through the loss of land during wars and occupations, and is eventually the establishment of an altar to Baal, an idol god, which later was turned into a latrine, by the way. The Samaritans also had their temple to God in Samaria, but it was a lower temple. It certainly was not on par with the temple in Jerusalem. I mean, here was where the real Jews studied and worshipped and prayed the pious Jews, the true children of Israel. These are where you will find those Jews who are of pure race, not mixed breeds as those Assyrians and Sumerians were. 
In today's drawing of map, it would be like the PLO or Hamas in Palestine, only now they're Muslims, not even Jews or Christians. To bring it home, the Native American tribe of Ojibwe live and have lived in this district of the most polluted zip code of Detroit for centuries. Jesus is telling us, I think, that our neighbor is anyone and everyone we might find the opportunity to be of service to, whether they be in Detroit, in Royal Oak, in Palestine, in Latin America, or in the most polluted zip code in Michigan. I think we can all take a bit of responsibility as we enjoy our air-conditioned houses. I know I can, and maybe the next time we purchase our family car, we can think of maybe getting one that's one size smaller, a little bit more efficient, thinking about our friends living downwind from the oil refinery. After all, everything I do to close the loop contributes to the cycle of life. Let me say this one more time. My neighbor is anyone and everyone I might have an opportunity to be of service to, no matter where they live, who they are, and what role in God's creation they play. I have to end this with a little personal story of how this played out in our house recently. We recently planted our yard with native wild Michigan strawberries for this little fellow. And the fact is, we don't expect to ever get to eat them. We planted them because honestly, I don't like maintaining the grass so now I never have to again. The trouble occurred when this latest crop of plants started showing some spots and a little research showed a bit of a fungus. So we went to our friends at Uncle Luke's and asked them how we would treat it. The very first question they asked, do you want an organic, organic or a chemical treatment? Well, without thinking, my response was, well, I'm not gonna eat these, so why would it matter to me? The chemical plant, but it, plant treatment is half the price. So let's use that. Well, <laughs> I need to practice what I preach. So a little more research found that I don't need to do anything. What I need to do is just let the plants live. A lot of cases, they will naturally take care of themselves. So Michelle and I decided we are going to take the chemical fertilizer or treatment back to Uncle Lutz. And if we need to, we will buy the organic thinking about this little guy. He, after all, is one of God's creatures too. So that is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God.